I'm going to review these 21 year old travel books and let you know whether they're still useful in 2020. My name is Rob. I'm a tour guide and the founder of Trip Hacks DC Tours. On this channel, you will find my best tips, tricks, and hacks for exploring Washington, DC. So if you're interested in that sort of thing, make sure to subscribe to the channel and hit the bell notification icon so that you don't miss anything in the future. And after you're done watching Trip Hacks DC videos, head on over to triphacksdc.com for even more. Last year, I was in my favorite used bookstore here in DC when I came across a few gems. Washington DC travel guides from 1999. And it got me really curious because I had just finished revising the Trip Hacks DC guide ebook. By the way, if you didn't know that Trip Hacks DC has an ebook, I'll go ahead and leave a link down in the description so you can check it out. One cool thing about having an ebook is that you can go in and update it very easily. Unlike these books, which are literal moments in history. As I was flipping through these, I started to wonder, what would your trip be like if you relied on one of these 21 year old books to plan a trip nowadays? Would you still be able to plan a pretty good trip or would it be a total bust? So let's just go ahead and jump into the books and see what they have to say. Now, in case you can't see the covers, First, I've got The Idiot's Guide to Washington, D.C. There's no date on the front or back cover, but on the inside, it does say copyright 1999. And I've got Let's Go Washington, D.C., completely revised for 1999. I just can't get over the fact that these books are 21 years old. They're old enough to drink. Overall, I have to say that The Idiot's Guide is a lot more useful or at least it was back in the 90s. It's written in simpler language and generally just gets to the point, which is more or less the style that I tried to write the Trip Hacks DC book in. The Let's Go book is a lot more dense and the authors do a lot more editorializing. And to be completely honest, a lot of their comments have not held up well over the years, but I will get into that a little bit as we go along. Oh, and before I jump in, I wanna point out something that I think is particularly hilarious. Inside the Let's Go book are several color full page ads, and many of them are for collect calling companies. I don't know how well you can see this one, but this one is for 1-800-CALL-ATT. There's another one back here for MCI, and I don't know, I just get a kick out of this. So if you're old enough, Leave a comment on this video and let me know what your preferred collect calling company was. I think I personally liked 1-800-COLLECT because they had the best TV commercials, in my opinion. Or if you have absolutely no idea what I'm talking about right now, leave a comment down there and let me know that too. Okay, so both of the books start with some general travel tips. They have information about hotels, restaurant guides, the major tourist sites, and the Let's Go book also has some additional chapters about neighborhoods in the city, and the suburbs. So I'm going to tackle them in that order. Now, try to transport yourself back to 1999. You have to remember that planning a trip was so much different back then. Sure, we were all worried about Y2K, but there were a lot of people who didn't even use the internet at all, and definitely not on a daily basis. Which is why I absolutely love this quote from the Let's Go book. It says, just think how impressed provincial travelers will be when you casually mention that you planned your trip using the net. And this one from the Idiot's Guide. It's possible to get some great deals on airfare, hotels, and car rentals via the internet. So grab your mouse by the tail and start surfing. You could save a bundle on your trip. Remember that this was two full years before 9-11 and the aviation and travel landscape was a lot different. The Idiot's Guide recommends signing up for frequent flyer programs on the airline websites to take advantage of e-saver fares, which I agree with. This is good practice. You should always sign up for these frequent flyer programs so that you can get notified of deals. But then the book lists the website addresses for five airlines, American, Continental, Northwest, TWA, and US Airways, which yikes, because four out of those five airlines don't even exist anymore. For getting around using Metro and buses, the advice has held up pretty well and is mostly still applicable today. A big difference is that DC Circulator Bus did not exist in the 90s and Metro was a lot cheaper. I forgot that back then you could get a ride for as low as $1.10. The cheapest ride nowadays is $2, almost twice as expensive. Oh, and the taxi zone system. 
If you're watching this and you've lived in DC long enough to remember the zone system, leave a comment and let me know because I'm really curious. Here's what the Let's Go book says. Washington taxi fares are probably not what you're used to. Within the city, fares are based on a map that splits the city into eight zones and a number of subzones. Zone prices are fixed and the basic cost of your cab ride is determined by the zones in which you begin and end, but not the route in between. So this is different from the way that it works here now and most places in the world, where there's a meter in the cab and it counts up based on the distance that you travel and the amount of time that it takes. But for a long time, DC used this zone system. So locals got really good at knowing exactly where the zones started and ended. So by going to a certain spot to hail their cab and then getting dropped off at a certain spot and walking to their final destination, they could save a bunch of money. This was one of the true trip hacks before I was doing trip hacks. The problem was that for tourists, the zone system was super confusing. The other section that I found really interesting was the one about tours and tour companies. The Let's Go book references four tour companies, DC Ducks, Tourmobile, Old Town Trolley, and Gray Line. The walking tour section to me is even more interesting. I agree with the author of The Idiot's Guide, in which they say, DC tour guides are, in most instances, knowledgeable pros who delight in injecting a little humor into their patter. So you're bound to pick up a slew of interesting tidbits along the way. What's fascinating to me is that then it goes on to list three tour guides in the book. Not tour companies, but actual people along with their phone numbers so that you can call them when you get here, which I guess makes sense because how else could a small time walking tour company even advertise back then? It's crazy to think that Trip Hacks DC could not have existed 21 years ago, but really how could it have? Almost every single customer that comes on our tours discovered it because of the internet in one way or another, just crazy. Okay, so let's move into the accommodation section of these books. The Let's Go Guide basically only has a few pages about hotels and that's it. They've got the name of the hotel, address, phone number, and then about two, maybe three sentences describing them. The Idiot's Guide is a little bit more detailed. It starts off with some good tips about how to pick the hotel and a bit more detail about each, like a full paragraph in some cases. Still, considering how much time and effort I spend on reading reviews, looking at pictures, and doing research on hotels, I just can't fathom picking one based on two sentences in a book. But that's how it was back then. The other thing that strikes me is about how many hotels have changed names over the years. I know it's the same hotel because of the address, and some of them are the same now as they were back then, but many have changed ownership or changed names. Plus, we have a lot more hotels now than we did in 1999, which I guess shouldn't be surprising given the consistent growth in both business and leisure travel over the last 21 years. Okay, moving on to the sections about restaurants. I've said so many times on this channel, but restaurant recommendations are one of the hardest things for me to do. First, because there are far more restaurants in the city than I could ever possibly try. And second, because restaurants are constantly opening and closing. For example, in the restaurants episode of the Trip Hacks DC podcast, my guest said that Shaw is a hot restaurant neighborhood. In the Let's Go book, there are seven restaurants listed in this neighborhood, and five of them do not exist anymore. One of the restaurants that is still open is Ben's Chili Bowl. It's got some cool history, but is not typically a place where I send people. Of course, this description in the book makes almost no sense to me. It says, Ben's Chili Bowl, venerable neighborhood hangout after Homer Simpson and the self-declared Popes of Chili Town has wonderful chili dogs, chili burgers, and plain chili. Now I think this is a reference to that episode where Homer goes to the chili cook-off and eats the really spicy pepper that Chief Wiggum serves, but I have zero clue how this relates back to the Washington DC restaurant. So if anyone has an idea on this, please leave a comment and let me know, because I really wanna solve this mystery. I also wanna note that nowadays, Shaw is one of the best places to go for quality Ethiopian food. The Let's Go Guide does recommend about five Ethiopian restaurants. The Idiot's Guide, only recommends one. Now I know the tastes were a lot different 21 years ago, but this is just really unfortunate in my opinion. Now I'm not going to run through all of the restaurants recommended in these books, but I did read through them. And I will say that many, many of them do not exist anymore. And some of my personal favorite restaurants did not exist back in 1999. So as far as eating goes, 
these books do not hold up well over time. Moving on to the chapters about the tourist sites. I have to say, these books actually held up pretty well over the 21 years, which I guess makes sense because it's not like the Lincoln Memorial changes that much over time. Of course, there are two major memorials that are on my tour that could not be in these books. The World War II Memorial, which opened in 2004, and the Martin Luther King Jr. Memorial, which opened in 2011. Here's a tidbit that I actually find really interesting. The system for getting tickets to the Washington Monument is almost exactly the same today as it was back then. Except that nowadays you get your tickets in advance on the website recreation.gov. Back then you got them by calling Ticketmaster. Yes, the same Ticketmaster that everybody loves to hate. But I have to say that the biggest difference I noticed from reading these books was the process for visiting the Capitol and the White House. If you've watched Trip Hacks DC videos, then you probably know that the process for getting tickets to the White House is long and tedious, and there is no guarantee you'll ever get one. In 1999, the Idiot's Guide says, unless you have VIP tickets, you'll have to stop into the White House Visitor Center. 8 a.m. is not too early. 7 a.m. will guarantee a ticket. Which, yeah, means you could get same-day tickets and walk right into the White House. For visiting the Capitol, it actually says, don't trip over the steps. To understand this reference, you have to know that the Capitol Visitor Center, the giant mega underground visitor center that exists now, did not break ground until the year 2000 and didn't open until 2008. After 9-11, they decided they really needed to beef up security. So they basically permanently sealed all of the main doors and required that any visitor come in through the visitor center. But in 1999, you basically just walked up to the Capitol, climbed the stairs, and walked in the door. It's just really crazy how different things were in those pre-9-11 days. The last thing that I wanna cover are the chapters about neighborhoods that are in the Let's Go Guide. The authors of this book clearly preferred some neighborhoods over others. And you can tell their preference just by looking at the order they put them in and how many pages they dedicated to each. The first neighborhood in this chapter is Georgetown, and they've got lots of nice things to say about Georgetown. They write, The face of Georgetown is one of the snapshot images of DC. Quiet, narrow, tree-lined streets of flat and boxy brick row houses. Today, both high income and high status, Georgetown is divided between boutiques that scream trendy and residential areas that whisper quaint. Followed by nine pages of things to see and do around Georgetown. By comparison, the chapter on the Capitol Hill neighborhood gets less than one page, and it's not exactly a glowing review. They say, the Metro Escalator dumps visitors into a littered, unkempt grassy plot. Welcome to Southeast. The walk down 8th Street Southeast offers fast food restaurants, unglamorous and mostly uninteresting shops and services, and some boarded up storefronts. The disorder on 8th Street is abruptly interrupted by the uniformity, nobility, and basic cleanliness of the marine barracks. Now look, this area has changed a lot over the years, and it was not always the city's most desirable area. But the street that they describe as unglamorous and uninteresting is now home to two of our Michelin-starred restaurants and a lot of other very nice places. So even by 1999 standards, this seems pretty harsh. And lastly, there are neighborhoods that didn't make this book at all because they basically didn't exist in 1999. If you come to Washington DC now and wanna to go to a baseball game, you'll find yourself in the Navy Yard neighborhood. And almost nothing that is there now existed in that form in 99. Or maybe you're gonna find yourself at the wharf going to a concert or catching the water taxi. That certainly didn't exist in 1999 either. So my overall assessment is that if you tried to use 21 year old travel books to plan a trip nowadays, you would have a pretty lousy time. Basically any pre 9-11 travel book is going to have a ton of shortcomings. But even if this book was from say 2002, I still think it would be hard to use it because hotels and restaurants would be out of date, you'd still be missing several of the major monuments and memorials, and you would have no idea how to go to a Washington Nationals baseball game. But this is also an excellent reminder for me that I really need to keep the Trip Hacks DC Guide ebook up to date so that it doesn't wind up in someone else's video like this 20 years from now. And that's it, thank you for watching this video. And if you're coming to DC and wanna check out the Trip Hacks DC Guided Tours, you can click or tap on the Capitol Dome on the left side of my head. 
that I'll send you right over to TripHexDC.com where you can see everything that we offer. Enjoy your trip!